We had 2024 Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on Rising this past week, and he talked about all things COVID, transgender athletes, and of course, aliens. But now it seems like there's been a call to cancel us. <laughs> Former <laughs> CNN sports commentator Keith Olbermann tweeted on Friday in response to our interview and RFK Jr.'s comments on the lab leak theory of COVID-19. Dear The Hill, you forfeited your right to keep doing this. Fire these conspiracy nuts, Robbie Suave and Brie uh, Bri Joy. <laughs> I guess that's you, Brie Bri Joy. Twitter handle. <laughs> uh oh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Shutter the operation, close down the cameras. Hope you can regain your credibility as a sorta news organization. Yeah, and an important part of this story is that, unsurprisingly, he received quite the ratio. Uh, for those who don't live on the internet, that means you have a bad ratio of comments to likes, a lot more people commenting basically to tell you that you're wrong, compared with the number of people who liked the tweet to tell you that you were right. I wish he had done this in video format, because <laughs> I miss his, his just thunderous, um, breathless commentary. The worst people in the world, Brianna Joy Gray and Robbie I mean, this, this is what's so frustrating. I mean, not too long ago, I, like many people, enjoyed his, you know, Bush two era commentary. It seemed like we were all on the same side back in the day and his somewhat bombastic approach seemed to really channel genuine frustrations of the American people. And then some, at some point, I don't know if it's Trump derangement or Russiagate or what have you, he seemed to just you know, go off on a lamb. And it's, it's frustrating because there was a lot about him that I once really liked and enjoyed. His turn as the whale version of himself on BoJack Horseman is one of my favorite characters. Oh, I, don't, I haven't seen that show. I don't know what that. And he seems kind of self aware. Yeah, he plays as, you know, in BoJack, all the characters are animals. And so he plays like a blue whale news mm -hmm. reporter who's got a big head and is really bombastic. And it, it seems self aware. Like, like he's in on the joke and it makes you like him. It's endearing. But at this point, look, it's. Fine well, for people to criticize us, but what is the substantive criticism here? Couldn't he just say something on the interview that he disagreed with? Maybe we also disagreed with it. We pushed back um, on many right. things that RFK Jr. said in that interview, but is the fact of interviewing people now a crime in and of itself? Uh, right, and, and the part that he was, so he was reacting to, and we had, you know, we tweeted a clip of the interview, and so he was quote tweeting that, and that's the part where I say, if the COVID, if the origins of COVID are lab leak funded by U.S., then is there a case for actually pursuing criminal charges against Fauci-type people? Let's actually play it. Friends of our show, Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi, reported the other day that the earliest COVID patients actually did come from the Wuhan lab. They were scientists there. If this is confirmed, it would all but guarantee the lab leak theory, which I believe you've said in the past, you also think uh, COVID originated from a Chinese lab. If that is the case, I want to know, will you prosecute Fauci and hold others criminally responsible in the U.S. health apparatus who advocated and funded gain-of-function research? Uh, I think I'm going to have to look at that, but I think they should be prosecuted. I think um, it was you know, reckless endangerment. Uh, they knew, you know, these all of these labs, including the Wuhan lab, had a history of leaks. Uh, there were numerous memos from the State Department and others saying that the lab was dangerous. It wasn't even a, B a cell four lab that they were doing these this research in. It was a B BSL two, BSL three labs that have, uh, you know, have very very low thresholds and have have uh, and this kind of research is malpractice to do it in the labs that the, the actual scientists who got ill, who they're now saying is patient one, is Ben Hu, who was the underling for the bat lady for Xi Zheng Li, and his funding and her funding came directly from NIH, and NIH taught them the technology for developing, not only for, uh, for making the technology that was used to make these viruses more infectious, uh, more virulent, more deadly, but also the, this technology called the seamless ligation technique, which is just a bioweapons technique for concealing human tampering on engineered viruses. And uh, it was utterly irresponsible to be 
teaching anybody that. They should not have developed that technique in the first place. It's the inverse of everything that mm. you would do if you actually were interested in public health. Mm. It's just um, it's bioweapons technology. Right. So there you have it. I, I think it would be reasonable to hold, if it is the case, that our public health officials uh, and their advocacy of this research and uh, yeah. Fauci himself signed off on is what caused a pandemic that killed millions and millions and millions of people. Yeah. There would be there would be repercussions. And he and again, he was agreeing that we're not we're not jailing Fauci for, you know, having mask mandates or something. We are saying there should be consequences if it is the case and if it is borne out that incautious funding, researching, safety protocols were not followed, and it resulted in, an, in a pandemic that killed millions of people. That is not at all a crazy thing to think. He was reacting to that. And then there was a little debate I, I was seeing in, in the response. Mm -hmm. uh, Mehdi Hassan, again, we've been mm -hmm. talking about a lot lately, said, pretty sure the criminality is from those who wrecked the response, denied care, hoarded ventilators, et cetera. And Ryan Grimm responds, like, okay, let's, we can have that conversation, it but both. you're saying there's no, <laughs> there's, there should be no liability and, for- And Mehdi responds, that's a lot of ifs, Ryan, right? Yeah. Like, it's a lot of, well, yes, if right. those things, but if, that's the point that people are trying to investigate. Some people are trying to investigate to find out if those things are true. Mm -hmm. And other people are so concerned about how those truths, if they bear out, are going to be politically weaponized that they don't even want to know what happened. This is this is kind of at the core of why there was so much resistance to lab leak theory. It wasn't about the obvious possibility that that could be the origin of COVID. It was about who it was in the political context who was advocating or seemed to be most open to lab leak theory from the very beginning. And because it became partisan and politicized, a lot of liberals who kind of shouldn't have had any skin in the game, they're not Fauci, they're not working in the lab, they're not working for the CDC, they're not liable, they're the ones that are hurt by it, they're the ones that are staying inside, they're the ones that whose family members are dying because of COVID. But they became invested in mm -hmm. squashing that narrative simply because, I don't know, Donald Trump said it could be true. Right. And, did Joe, and Joe Biden said it could be true, right, too. Right. Like, well, now, a lot of sober. Um, and actually, initially, Joe Biden expressed more concern over it when Trump was president. Mm. He was all eager to oh, right. get along he had that with, uh, with the, the Chinese leadership. Yeah. Um, and then he, you know, then he pivoted to calling it right. Wuhan flu or whatever. Right. And so people couldn't deal with that. I also think this is a great um, representation of the evolution of Keith Olbermann and Keith Olbermann type people from, you brought up his, his Bush era commentary, mm -hmm. which you liked, mm -hmm. which was really all about the threat to civil liberties mm -hmm. that, uh, that the Bush administration represented and it's, you know, pushing us to, to, into war based on false premises, um, the kind of, you know, Patriot Act era surveillance and all of that being bad, just so obviously offensive from a liberal perspective. Now, you know, he's someone who, you know, I'm paraphrasing it. I don't know if he's ever had a tweet that exactly says this, but it's, it's very like, you know, jail Trump for treason kind, right. of, kind of rhetoric. It's very, um, it's very, help me law enforcement, you're my only hope. Yeah. You have to come in and rescue this country from the political choices of the people. That is so anathema to what, to what him and people like him were doing in the aughts. Yeah. That's become so... Uh, I need help from the powers that be to stop this person I really don't like. And, and an implication that quasi-legal means would be perfectly acceptable. Yeah, and the, the asymmetry with feeling that way with respect to Fauci, the, the asymmetry of saying, if you were to want to prosecute Fauci, I mean, the implication here is it is purely political and something out of a banana republic to want to round up people that you simply disagree with. There's some parallels between that and the argument that Trump defenders are making, saying that you're weaponizing the Espionage Act that has historically been used to go after whistleblowers, and this is a, 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 a political prosecution. We live in a world now where everyone feels as though prosecutions, a desire to have any kind of accountability, is targeted and political. And frankly, it feels like that is a true statement. 
Now, a, a prosecution being political doesn't mean that someone didn't actually do something wrong and deserve to have accountability. But my my bigger, my growing concern is that in the interest of seeming fair, in the interest of protecting your guy, there's going to be a sort of detente where everyone agrees that nobody can ever be held accountable. And when I say nobody, I mean people who are rich and powerful. And that is the deal that has been struck in D.C., you know, in government for a very long time. Nixon doesn't go to jail. Bankers aren't prosecuted after the financial collapse. Hillary isn't prosecuted. Pence isn't prosecuted. Biden is unlikely to be prosecuted for this document case. Mm -hmm. And the Donald Trump being prosecuted of it all does stand to perhaps open a Pandora's box of sorts. And it's not entirely clear to me that everybody has really played out how far far this is going to go. There's two ways to have consistency. To also prosecute Donald Trump for his lesser crimes of an un- unlawfully retaining documents, mm-hmm. but which are, in fact, crimes that have been prosecuted for normal people, or to let Donald Trump off the hook. And you could argue that if you really do care about accountability, the move is to apply the rules consistently and against the more powerful people. That also includes someone like Anthony Fauci, if it is actually demonstrated yeah. that he knew about Absolutely. the inadequ- inadequacies. Well, and look, I, I can also see an argument that, and I'm not saying I co sign this, but an argument that the president or the political figure, the accountability should is actually the democratic process. Mm-hmm. That could be true for Trump, Biden, Bush, Bill Clinton, all of those people. Again, I'm not saying I agree with this, but sure. that ultimately we. There's going to be more leeway. There should be more leeway because the from the legal standpoint, because the ultimate check is the people. The people get to decide if they want this guy. But that doesn't apply to Fauci and people, like just government employees, just people who were like he's not subject to Democrat or he's much further removed from Democratic accountability than the president or a senator or someone like that. There's no way to get at him we, we, that because he's appointed by someone else and 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 so on. Um, you ha- you you have to have some kind of legal mechanism mm. for digging at those people, or else they're just totally unaccountable. And, and I do think that part of why RFK Jr. seems credible to folks is he does talk about some undeniable um, perverse incentive structures, like limited liability, like the mm-hmm. ability to profit uh from NIH um, doctors, from vaccine sales. Say what you want about their hearts and souls and their good intentions, but you can't deny how some of these incentive structures are going to have perverse outcomes, no matter how well-meaning a person is. And when you see the world is rigged, when you see these incentive structures rigging outcomes or predicting outcomes the way that they do, it does lead you to the conclusion. It, it is, is it, it is easier to jump to certain other kind of conclusions that may or may not be burn, borne out about the underlying science or whether or not the government or whomever is purposefully out to get to you. So, yeah, if, if it is the case that we're saying, well, he has a liability shield or we're going we're gonna to selectively not prosecute him because, you know, he was working in the interest of the government or, you know, the, the administration at the time, that is going to have an effect on public trust. And you cannot have it both ways. If you want there to be more unanimity of opinion about things like vaccines and science and the CDC and administrative funding, you have to have some sense of accountability. And that means both being open to the idea of prosecuting people who are proven, proven to have done harm, not just randomly, but actually proven in a court of law, and also addressing some of these fundamental structural incentives. Absolutely. All right, we'll have more rising right after this.